أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, It's good to see you all again الحمد لله Apologies for the late start um, Let's start off by a brief recap uh, or reminder rather uh, what we're doing here. Yes. So, the broader series is on some stories in the Quran. Right? And last time we uh, were together, the topic was Yes, Al Quds or Masjid Al Aqsa. Particularly, Masjid Al Aqsa from the Quran. And we spoke in quite detail, uh, good um, interactive uh, story with a lot of the younger brothers uh, in the audience about the history um, of this place, this area, uh, this Arda Muqaddasa, this uh, holy place. Holy Land, Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa in particular. And we stopped at the lifetime or just before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. Right, so we wanted to just maybe talk about a few things with regards to the Masjid al-Aqsa mentioned in the Qur'an during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And maybe a bit of history after that. But before we start that, um, let's have a recap. So, who can tell me when Masjid Al-Aqsa was built first? The first time it was built. Hmm? Masjid Al-Aqsa, when was it built originally? Time of Sulaiman alayhi salam. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? Adam alayhi salam, 50 years after Masjid al-Haram. Yes, so, as we mentioned last time, uh, Abu Dharr radiallahu anhu, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam once, he said, which was the, what was the first house built for the worship of Allah on earth, for people? And what was the first house, a masjid built? And he said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, al-Masjid al-Haram. Then Abu Dhar asked what was the second, what was after that. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. What was the time between them? 40 years. 40 years. So the scholar said, Masjid Al-Aqsa was built was by, or originally built by either Adam salam or his son. Okay. Then fast forward a few hundred or a few thousand years, Allah knows what happened to it. Who re-established, rebuilt it on the foundations left by Adam alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? And Ibrahim alayhi salam established how many sanctuaries or re-established how many sanctuaries, how many holy places on earth? Hmm? Minimum two, inshallah. That's a very safe answer. <laughs> what were they? Yeah. Excellent, inshallah. We all know the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam leaving his wife and son, wife Hajar and son Ismail alayhi salam as a baby in Mecca. And that's where, you know, the story of Hajj and we, we and Umrah and we were about to see that in the coming weeks, inshallah, replayed by millions of people from all across the world, going through the footsteps of this woman, alayhi salam. But what many of us don't uh, remember that often is Ibrahim alayhi salam used to come and visit Ismail alayhi salam as he was growing up. 
And on one of this one of these visits, السلام, he and Ismail السلام, rebuilt the Kaaba right and lay certain uh, the, the foundations that are that we have until today. Right? But with his other son in uh, Palestine in Jerusalem, he established or according to some scholars either Ishaq alayhi salam and his father Ibrahim alayhi salam or Ishaq alayhi salam and his son who was Yaqub alayhi salam. Right? They that family, they that father and son and grandfather, they established or at least one of them established the foundations that uh re established the foundations of Masjid al Aqsa. Then fast forward a few years. What happened? What was the next thing we discussed? They were living in this area which is now called which is now Palestine. Right? Um in Jerusalem, they living there, Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son, Ishaq alayhi salam, he's a prophet, he's guiding people, he's teaching people how to worship Allah. He has a son. What's his son's name? Ya'qub alayhi salam. Ya'qub alayhi salam has how many sons? Yeah. Twelve, or at least twelve. Twelve. Right? <laughs> And we then know the whole story of Yusuf alayhi salam, right? Yusuf alayhi salam and his brothers and, you know, their love for their father and they're becoming jealous of the, the, the love for Yusuf alayhi salam and that whole story. During that story, where did they all move? To Egypt, right? Why? Because there was a famine. So, you know, it was the Qadr of Allah that the, the, the people would shift from that area into Egypt and lived there for many generations. What was the other name of Yaqub alayhi salam? Israel. Right, that's where the name Israel comes from. And his progeny, his descendants were therefore called Banu Israel. Right? Now for many many generations prophethood for Banu Israel was blessed with prophets, one after the other, after the other, after the other. When one would pass away, Allah would send another one. When he would pass away, Allah would send another one. And over the years, Bani Israel, between Yusuf alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam, for Allah knows how many centuries, they became slaves. They became enslaved by the uh, native Egyptian population, i.e., by Fir'aun. Right? Allah mentions all of the, you know, the, the the oppression and the subjugation and the torment they would suffer. Right? They would slaughter their children, leave their women alive, and so forth. And now, in this scenario, comes Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam. His, amongst his core missions is what? To liberate, to save Bani Israel, to free them. Banu Israel, this entire nation that has been enslaved by Pharaoh. And when he liberates them, where does he take them? Back to uh, Jerusalem, back to Masjid al-Aqsa. So he is telling these people now that, you know, we've, Allah has saved us. You know? Uh, all we have to do now is go into, go back into Masjid al-Aqsa, go back into the Holy Land, and you will all live happily ever after. But is that what they did? No. They refused. And we mentioned in some detail last uh, time we were here about some of the psychology behind that refusal. Right? Because these were people who were subjugated internally. Musa alayhi salam was a bit different. Obviously he was a prophet. He had the tarbiyah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what else was different about him? Who remembers? About his upbringing. He grew up rubbing shoulders with leaders. Not with subjugated people. So his, his outlook, his thinking was not of a subjugated person. 
If somebody subjugates you internally, that's it, game over. Even if you're free and your body is free, you'll kind of revert back to some kind of subjugation. So they were saying, you know, no, 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 you and Allah go and fight. We're not going to go into that land. And because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them to wander the desert for 40 years. And during this time, um, those people who were subjugated, who had that subjugated mentality, who disobeyed Musa alayhi salam, passed away. And their children, the young people who grew up with a free mentality, with a liberated mentality, who went enslaved by Pharaoh, they now became of age, right? And they were now able to uh, go and liberate Masjid al Aqsa under the Prophet who? Yusha bin Nun. So Musa alayhi salam, despite his longing, he really wanted to go back to Masjid al Aqsa because of uh, his job of leading Banu Israel. It was not in Allah's plan for him to be there while he was alive. So he asked, we mentioned, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, let me be buried a stone's throw away from Masjid al-Aqsa. Right? And as we'll talk about today, Musa alayhi salam was there after his death in the life of the Barzakh, in the life that is between this death and the resurrection, all of the prophets have some connection with this place as we uh, will remind ourselves again so Yusha ibn Nun he takes a, a, a small group of dedicated patient perseverant Muslims from Bani Israel <clears throat> and they're able to liberate the city then the time of who comes many prophets different prophets one after the other time of Dawood alayhi salam Suleiman alayhi salam and there's a cycle through from, from before until now. When the Muslims were patient, obedient, righteous, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them access to this holy place. And when they began to weaken in their iman and in their obedience to Allah, Allah allowed people to overcome them and to drive them out. So there are cycles, people coming back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Until the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right. The most recent or the last Prophet before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is who? Isa ibn Maryam. Isa alayhi salam. Right. What time is it, Isha? Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Isa alayhi salam is the most is the last Prophet before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Between them is 600 odd years. Now, Isa alayhi salam was from, or was sent to Banu Israel. Right? Um, technically, he's part of the, you know, he's, he's, he's one of the prophets of Banu Israel. However, there's a subtlety Allah mentions in the Quran when Isa alayhi salam refers to Banu Israel. You know, some of the Mufassirin mentioned. Musa alayhi salam, for example, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ لِمَا تُؤْذُونَنِي وَقَدْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ And mentioned when Moses said to his people, his قوم, Oh my قوم, my people, why do you, you know, harm me, why do you bother me when you know when, when that I am a messenger of Allah sent to you. But in the same surah, Surah Saf, Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ التَّوْرَةِ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, recall, remember the story of Isa alayhi salam, He didn't say, Oh my people, Isa said to his people, Oh my people. No, he said, Isa said to Bani Israel, when I remember when Isa said, Oh Bani Israel, indeed I'm a messenger sent to you, confirming what's already with you from, uh, of the Torah. Why is this different? You know, I think we discussed it before. 
rings a bell? So was uh, Musa So Musa alayhi salam, Allah quoted, he said, Ya qawmi, O oh my people. Isa alayhi salam is quoted, he said, O, oh, no, he said, O oh, Bani Israel. Yeah. So you know, whenever you see a difference, this is part, uh, uh, two things which you would assume are similar. When you see them different, this is a, an avenue to make tadabbur of the Qur'an. To reflect and ponder on the Quran, to ask the question: Why did Allah say this for this prophet and something else for another? And usually, if you reflect, you'll find a secret there. Right? You'll find some kind of benefit or wisdom. And the Mufassirin did this. They said, "Look, Subhanallah, look at the subtlety." Musa alayhi salam said, "My qawm." Isa alayhi salam said. Albani Israel. What was the biggest difference between those two? He was ethnically Jewish as well. Yeah. But where does your lineage come from? Your father. It's because of your father that you are ascribed to this qawm or another qawm. Right? Isa alayhi salam had no father. Miraculous birth. So Allah quoted him as saying, Ya Bani Israel. Musa alayhi salam on the other hand, he had a father and he's from a paternal side and a maternal side, he's from Bani Israel. So he said, My qawm, Ya qawm. Yeah. Only men from his lineage were allowed to have and his daughters. Yeah. So Isa alayhi salam his whole story was about where? About what? His whole story was coming and preaching to the the Muslims who were from a lineage point of view from the descendants of Israel alayhi salam, Ya'qub alayhi salam, right? And they were in the Jerusalem area, but it was under Roman occupation, right? So Isa alayhi salam came to, um, to, to, to nurture them spiritually, and according to some scholars, to liberate them from Roman occupation. But this is where the story was happening. But when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was born, he narrated later, that a light came from his mother and illuminated some cities of Sham, of this whole region Palestine, Jordan, Syria, this area even though he's from the Arabian Peninsula he said a light came and illuminated Busra a town, a city uh, symbolizing that Islam will go there right? And once he saw Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a dream underneath his pillow, he said the light of the Qur'an, the light of the Qur'an is reaching into Sham. Likewise, when he said, before my, uh, uh, he said before the day of resurrection, count a number of things. My death, then the liberation of Al-Quds. Right? My death, and then the next thing was the liberation of Al-Quds. So this was... From the start, the Prophet ﷺ was framing this as this is the natural progression where Islam will spread. right? Because the previous Prophets were all Muslim anyway. But there is one thing which the Prophet ﷺ, which solidified the Prophet ﷺ's relationship with this place. And that is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Subhanallahi asra bi abdihi. Laylan min al Masjid al Harami il al Masjid al Aqsa. Alladi barahna hawla. Li nuriyahu min ayatina. Inna hu huwasami al Basir. 
Subhanallahi, the beginning of Surah Isra. Subhanallah, a statement of amazement. A statement of uh, astonishment. You know, how great is Allah, how pure and perfect is Allah. The one who took his slave on a journey in the middle of the night. From Al Masjid Al Haram to Masjid Al Aqsa. I don't know how many miles away. Right? All in one night. Alladhi barakna hawla. The place that the surroundings of which we have made blessed. Why? Li min ayatina. So that we may show him some of our signs. What's this referring to? The Isra and Mi'raj. This happened towards the end of the Meccan phase of the Prophet ﷺ, before the Hijrah. More specifically, this happened right after the most difficult and the saddest time in the Prophet ﷺ's life. Aisha anha once asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what was the most difficult day of yours in your whole life? Right. And he said, when the people drove me out of Ta'if. This incident happened at the end of what is known as Amul Huzm. The year of grief, the year of sadness, the year of sorrow. In one year, the Prophet ﷺ lost his beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha. In the same year, he lost his uncle, Abu Talib, who was his protection outside of the house. Khadija radiallahu anha was his protection, his uh, soulmate, his comfort inside the home. And Abu Talib was his protection politically outside. To, and he was the reason why they weren't killing the Prophet wasallam. They weren't trying to kill him. Like they tried to kill and, and they tortured and killed other companions, the ones without you know, the tribal backing. But Abu Talib was his protection in the society in Mecca. And when he died, he went looking for other tribes to make allegiances with, such as in at Ta'if. And the people drove him out, pelting him with stones, until his blood was running down his legs and sticking to his sandals. Wasallam. In this time, when he was in the saddest part of the seerah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him and took him up to the highest part of his life. And the highest part of creation. Higher than anyone else has gone, even angels. When the Prophet wasallam went up on a tour through the skies, through the heavens. And he saw and he was given this personal gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of us have seen this. Right? We just know what happened from the Prophet ﷺ narrating it. This was a special gift to his beloved Messenger ﷺ. Seeing all of this you know, uh, splendor, all of the going through the skies, seeing Jannah, having a tour of paradise, having a, uh, uh, seeing some of the punishments of the people of the hellfire as well. Reinvigorating the, the Prophet ﷺ's uh, journey But before that one happened The Isra Isra is a journey at night The Prophet ﷺ said He was In Mecca Near the Masjid uh, In Masjid Al-Haram And Jibreel السلام, Came and took him He said Jibreel السلام, Brought an animal A beast that was smaller than a mule and larger than a donkey and it's called Burak from lightning so you know this is going to be a fast animal I hate to be the one to break it to you but it doesn't have wings <laughs> some on some uh, you know pictures people depict it with wings and all that as far as I'm, I, I know uh, there's no nothing reported about it having wings or anything it's just a, a, a riding beast um, that is very very fast the Prophet Sallallahu said it's each of its strides is the length of the distance to the, the horizon that you can see right 
I think you can see about five miles on a good day on a flat surface. Anyway, um, Jibreel Islam brought it near, and it said uh, some narration said that it had a saddle and a muzzle on, on it as well. So it's like a proper beast. Allah knows which dimension or whatever, which world it's from. But when the Prophet ﷺ drew near it and mounted on it, it began to get a bit uh, anxious. You know, like any animal, uh, any horse, when somebody new comes on. And Jibreel, Jibreel ﷺ pulled its reins and said, Have some haya, have some shame. Don't you know that no one has ever ridden you who is more beloved to Allah than this man who is riding you now? Right? Which shows it's, it's an actual beast. This isn't some kind of dream that the Prophet ﷺ had. It was a physical journey. Right? How you can traverse large distances in a short space of time, this is for another day. <laughs> if anyone's in, into physics here, we'll talk about it later. But we know, we have Iman, that this is a, a real journey. Right? Narrated... Um, by over 20 different companions. This is very, very numerous in its narration. So the Prophet ﷺ was taken on Al Burraq uh, in a very, very uh, long journey, in a very short space of time. And when he reached uh, Masjid Al Aqsa, during this time, obviously, this, the, the, the area wasn't under Muslim control, it was under either Persian control according to some or uh, Roman uh, control right and neither of these two empires respected it any uh, at all it wasn't a uh, you know considered a holy place for them in fact uh, when it was under uh, Roman by this time the Roman Empire had become Catholic when it was under Roman Christian control just to show their contempt for Jews and the Jew and Jewish history, they had turned Masjid al-Aqsa, the, the, the area, the compound, where they believed, or the whole area where they believed Sulaiman alayhi salam's masjid to be, they had turned it into a rubbish dump. Right? And the, the, the Christians and Jews had a, uh, an animosity with one another for many centuries. Okay. But during this time, when the Prophet ﷺ was brought, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, some scholars say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almost rebuilt the entire edifice for the Prophet. ﷺ. So he tied, uh, Jabir tied Burak to a particular place. The Prophet ﷺ went to Masjid al Aqsa, and we remember we said the whole compound is Masjid al Aqsa. Not just one masjid, there's different masjids inside it. The whole area is called Masjid Al-Aqsa. The Prophet ﷺ went and prayed two rak'ah there. And when he... And remember, and this period of the time, uh, this period of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, this is the Qibla that they've been praying towards. Right? This is before the Hijrah, after which it was changed towards the Kaaba. So this is the place that they've all been praying towards. The Prophet ﷺ prayed two rak'ah when he entered the masjid and he said, when I lifted my head, I saw all of the Prophets gathered. And I was shy. So Jibreel ﷺ pushed me forward to be the Imam. And the Prophet ﷺ led all of the Prophets, 124,000 Prophets, in one prayer. How? This is only Allah knows. How long the line would have been and <laughs> all these things, you know, what kind of dimensions we're looking at. However, the fact of the matter is the Prophet ﷺ solidified his, or re it was reinforced for him that he is the Imam of all the Prophets and the Messengers, uniting all peoples. Pe prophets are amongst a, a whole a variety of roles, they're symbolic leaders of different peoples throughout time and throughout space right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent or raised prophets in every nation ever sent ever ever that existed uh, on earth 
right? After the prophets passed away, the people would change, some people would change their religions, change their practices, and then Allah would send another prophet. But every prophet was there symbolizing the whole of humanity. And the Prophet ﷺ was, and we know is, one of his descriptions is, the Sayyid of Bani Adam, the leader of all of the children of Adam and his salam. So in this time, the Prophet ﷺ, he um, is there in this place, in this sanctified place, with all of the prophets and messengers. And in some narration, he says, you know, he sees when he came, he saw particularly different prophets standing and praying. He said, I saw Musa alayhi salam, and he looks very similar to such and such person. So people could see, you know, oh, he looks like that. I saw Isa alayhi salam, I saw Yahya alayhi salam, and I saw Ibrahim alayhi salam. And I know nobody else who looks more like him except myself. Meaning he was like a spitting image of his great 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 grandfather, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then what happened? Jibreel came. Oh sorry, I forgot. Before he even left Mecca, Jibreel alayhi salam took his heart out and washed it in a bowl of iman or in a bowl of zamzam, according to some narrations. What this, this, this happened once before in the life of the Prophet ﷺ when he was a child, right? When his uh, foster sister saw, you know, she, she, she came to the house running saying, you know, somebody's killed Muhammad, somebody's killed Muhammad. I saw them take his heart out, right? And it was two angels who took his heart out, removed the black spot, washed it and put it in his chest again. And he had this mark on his chest all his whole life Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anh said but this happened again just before al-Isra'am al-Mi'raj but there was no dark spot why why did the Prophet why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to cleanse and clean his heart to prepare him for what wonders he was going to see on this journey right, to strengthen him and the companions would say if a normal person was shown a little bit of what Muhammad ﷺ was shown, he would have lost his mind and gone crazy. Just taking in those sights. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ma zag al basar wa ma taga. His sight, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was shown, in Surah Al Najm explained some of the, the things the Prophet ﷺ went through in the, 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 the journey through the heavens. Allah said, He didn't. You know, twitch his eye or look anywhere else. He took the whole view in. Yeah. So when, after he led the prayers in Masjid al-Aqsa, Jibreel alayhi salam came and brought him two vessels. He said, choose and that will be the choice for your ummah. One vessel had milk in it and one vessel had wine in it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ch chose the milk. And Jibreel alayhi salam said, you have chosen the fitrah, the innate natural disposition. If you had chosen the wine, your ummah would have been led astray after you. Right? And this is, there's a lot of symbolism in this. The ulama have discussed, you know, we're not talking about this particular. But look at uh, milk and compare it to wine. Milk something pure. Allah has created from an animal. And inside of an animal is impure for us. If you just go and kill an animal right, without making it halal, that thing's impure. It comes, there's blood in there, there's all these things in there. But from it comes a pure substance. Right? Which the Prophet ﷺ would love to drink. And look at the other hand, on the other hand, wine. And, and milk, it gives you, it hydrates you, it gives you uh, nu nutrition, it gives you calories, it gives you so many different things, right? Benefit. Wine, on the other hand, what, what does it do? Inherently, it's what? It's something filthy. It starts off as, you know, juice, which is pretty good, but then it gets infected with uh, yeast, bacteria, whatever, and it starts to ferment become, with the waste product of the bacteria. <laughs> right? It's something dirty, smelly. And look at the effect it has on someone. Right? We don't need to go into it in detail, but 
Look at this, uh, this, this contrast. Right? And from there the Prophet ﷺ was then taken up. Burak stayed there. Jibreel ﷺ took the Prophet ﷺ on a journey throughout the heavens. Right? So that was in the... That was to do with that ayah that in Surah Isra. We should all go home and, and, and you know, uh, read it. Uh, reflect on it, inshallah. So, that was... Then the Prophet ﷺ was, after all of his journey, he was brought back to Masjid al-Aqsa, right? And then he uh, rode al-Burraq back to Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, the, 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 the miracle didn't stop there, the, the, the journey didn't stop there. When the Prophet ﷺ got back, immediately people started to... Um, Word spread, right? Not of the Mi'raj part, the the journey through the heavens, but just the part of traveling to Jerusalem and back in one night. So people began to, some people began to carry this this story, and in order to, and the enemies of Islam tried to tried to make fun of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Look what. Look what he's saying. He's saying he went to Jerusalem and back in one night. That's it. Now we've got, we've got him. All this time, you know, we haven't found anything solid to criticize him with. We've got him. This doesn't make sense. Going to Jerusalem one back, it takes us weeks. Right? So they began to quiz him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I became very anxious and nervous. You know, they're asking me so many questions. They said, tell me about this in Jerusalem. Tell me about that. People who have been there before, they said, okay, bring them forward. Ask him some questions to trip him up. And he said, sallallahu alayhi wa I was answering their questions, but I was getting worried and anxious. Like I've never been as worried before. And then, in the distance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised the whole city of Jerusalem for me. In front of my eyes, I could see the whole structure again. And he said, they wouldn't ask me a question except Allah would show me that part of Jerusalem. So, you know, they would say, for example, uh, what is, you know, how many doors in this side of this place? And Allah, Allah will show this to the Prophet. Should tell us, you know, the, the, the shape of the windows in that building. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show this to them. Until all of their questions were answered sufficiently and they were dumbfounded. So then they would say, okay, wait a second. If you came during this time and you came during this with this route, you would have seen two caravans on the way or this many caravans on the way. Because we know, you know, they left and they're on their way back. Prophet ﷺ said, yes. Such and such caravan was in that place and such and such caravan was in that place. And they said, if he's telling the truth, that means they should be here any minute. And lo and behold, they came just then. Right. Another story connected to this is the story of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. This is one of the uh, stories that the the, the ulama um, reinforce his name as-Siddiq. As-Siddiq is the pinnacle of Muslim, the best Muslim you can be, someone who excels in all areas. But linguistically, and there's a there's a central feature of as-Siddiq of a Siddiqiyah, is to testify to truth. To be a believer in truth. Right? And the Prophet, uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, somebody came and knocked on his door. You know, somebody trying to trip him up, to, to try to make him uh, be embarrassed of being a follower of the Prophet And listen to this, brothers, because it's very useful for us today. Or do you know what your prophet says? Do you know what your religion says to do X, Y, Z? Kind of like this kind of challenging. So he came to Abu Bakr Siddiq and said, Do you know what your companion is saying? Do you know what Muhammad is saying? He's saying he went all the way to Jerusalem and one night and came back. What did Abu Bakr Siddiq say? He said, and look at this statement. If he said it, 
then it's true. I'm not saying it's true or false. You could be lying. <laughs> right? If he said it, it is true. Why? And the, the reason he gave, right? the explanation he gave, is something we need to ponder over uh, a lot. He said, أُصَدِّقُهُ فِي مَا هُوَ أَعْجَبُ بِنْ ذَلِكَ I believe him in something which is more amazing than this. That he received revelation from the Lord above the heavens. Look at this uh, logic. Right? It's not a blind you know, following of whoever and uh, anyone and everyone. This is a man, Prophet Sallallahu he's known him his whole life. Right? He has beyond a shadow of a doubt, he has good reasons, a warranted belief to believe that this man is a messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amazing as it is, it is built from very strong intellectual principles. You know him. You hear this this, this speech that he suddenly started reciting at the age of 40, not having learned any, any way to read and write and poetry, any of this. You know he's making prediction and he's coming true. You know his character. That is more amazing than going to you know, uh, Jerusalem and back in one night. There are many explanations for that. But I believe him in something more amazing than that. This should form the basis of our iman. Right? There's no point arguing on you know, tertiary, secondary, quaternary issues about you know, hijab and the, what does this Islam say about this law and what do you do if this happens and that happens. No, no, no. Do you agree? Do you understand the main point of Islam in the first place? <laughs> Don't worship anything except Allah, the one who created you, the one you all believe in anyway. This man, Muhammad sallallahu he's a prophet because of X, Y, Z reasons. This life is a test. At the end of this life, there's going to be a judgment. These are the main core issues. If you believe in those, if you understand those, if you accept those, then anything else, just, yeah, minor. How do you pray, uh, you know, uh, your dress code or your penal code or this law or that law? It all comes under, it all just fits when... You understand the, the main point, the main premise of Islam. That's why when you're giving da'wah to people, you should, we should try and focus any conversation upon more important issues. You know, some people might hear this and that from the media, Islamophobia, whatever, all oh, Muslims and terrorism and this and then women's rights and that kind of stuff. These uh, projections Say okay We can talk about halal food if you want But can I dis- describe You know The world view first Why I'm a Muslim What a Muslim What Islam actually is Then when you talk about those things You talk about Allah You talk about how he's one You talk about the Prophet Muhammad sallam, The revelation These things resonate with a person's fitra anyway And then the hijab issue Or the halal meat issue Is going to be Trivial compared to that. So, the Prophet ﷺ returned and he was reinvigorated. A few months later, a, few, uh, a year or two later, what happened? The Hijrah to Medina. And in Medina, they meet uh, different Jewish tribes. And the Jewish tribes notice something. This man, this Prophet, we know he's a prophet, he's fulfilling all of our predictions, except he's not from our tribes. He's not from Bani Israel. But he's, he's facing and he's praying towards Jerusalem. How does he know this? You know? The connection to Masjid al-Aqsa remained very deep with all of the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ, we mentioned a few of the hadith, a hadith right? The Prophet ﷺ, uh, described how uh, Muslims are encouraged to go and pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. 
some of the companions were asking, you know, what is the uh, the best place to offer your prayers? You know, this masjid, Masjid Nabawi or Masjid Al-Aqsa? The Prophet Wasallam, he said the truth. He said, this masjid, Masjid Nabawi, you get more reward for praying. However, there will come a time where even looking at Masjid Al-Aqsa, finding a place just for your saddle to sit down and look at Masjid Al-Aqsa, will be more beloved to you than the whole dunya. While the Prophet ﷺ is preparing his Ummah. We already mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ said, count a few things after, uh, before the Day of Judgment. My death, then the liberation of Masjid Al-Aqsa. And you know, it was after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, 16 odd years after, that Umar radiallahu an, or maybe less, that Umar radiallahu an went and uh, liberated Masjid al-Aqsa or liberated uh, Jerusalem without a single drop of blood being spilt right but before that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is nurturing his Sahaba this love for Masjid al-Aqsa in his Sahaba until even people would make a promise another like, like saying oh Allah if this happens if you give me this then I will go to Masjid al-Aqsa and pray to Raqqa Right? Like if if Mecca is liberated again, we will go and pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. It shows that it was in their conscience, it was in their minds. Right? Even though Masjid, Masjid al-Haram, there's more reward for praying there. But it was embedded deeply into their hearts. And this is something we want to revive now. Because we have suffered from a period of uh, some would argue a sustained and, and deliberate period of de-Islamicization of Masjid al-Aqsa and removal of Aqsa from our collective uh, uh, thoughts, our, our imagination, our conscience. Until we, you know, we grow up, we see pictures of the Kaaba on the prayer mats, you know, on people's walls at home, the iconic green dome, Masjid al-Nabawi. But we don't have that same connection with Masjid al-Aqsa. Right? After the Prophet Sallallahu death, as we mentioned, Masjid al-Aqsa was liberated by Sayyidina Umar uh, Sayyidina Umar And the stories about the liberation of Masjid al-Aqsa and the, how Umar an dealt with all the different people uh, involved in this are amazing, absolutely amazing. It's not our remit here to discuss these things. But I'll just say a few things. And that is throughout the history, right now we have, we have the problem in looking at any, histor- any uh, event with any, any place with any historical significance. We, there is a problem, a, 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 a fallacy that occurs when we look at a particular place and its history through the lens of what it's like today. So we will look at, for example, Masjid al-Aqsa through the lens today. Today it's under occupation by, you know, uh, apartheid forces or occupying regimes and so forth. It's a place of restriction and so forth. It wasn't always like that. In fact, any time, the only time rather, that all Muslims, Christians and Jewish communities flourished in Jerusalem, in Palestine, was under the... uh, Muslim rulership. You know, when Umar an came to um, Jerusalem for the first time as its new leader, and the patriarchs, or the Christian patriarchs, requested Umar an to come because they they understood they knew him. He was a man of justice and and good moral character. They gave him the keys to Jerusalem and they laid out a two mile long red carpet for him. And we have the famous story of him and uh, Abu Abayda ibn Al Jarrah, you know, saying, you know, Ya Umar Amir Mu'minin, you know, shouldn't you change your clothes, wear some nice clothes? You know that story. Anyway, we can't go into that. But the point is, the Christian communities there, they loved ibn, uh, Umar ibn Al Khattab radiallahu anhu. But he did one thing that they didn't like. He invited back the Jewish tribes that were, the Jewish families that were expelled previously. And this has been a, a, a recurring theme 
whenever it came under Muslim control again, the Jewish families would be invited back. Compare that to any other time. Crusades, Zionism, all these types of kind of uh, annihilistic, almost apocalyptic movements to try and wipe the, the opposition out. No, no, no. In the time of Amr al in the time of Banu Umayya, in the time of Salah al in the time of even the Ottoman Empire, right? Jewish families were and Christian and Eastern Orthodox Christians were protected as minorities then. And that's the, the only time they truly flourish in those areas. There's, there's a very interesting book, and I'll finish with this. Uh, it's called, it's by, uh, I think, Robert G. Hoyland, called Seeing Islam as Other Saw It. It chronicles, it's like an encyclopedia almost, of statements about Muslims and Islam from non-Muslims throughout history. It's a very interesting statement from a monk in the time of, just after, I think, Mu'awiyah al so in Banu Umayya. Umayyad uh, dynasty and the Christian monk he's in uh, uh, I forgot which area it's kind of Mes- Mesopotamia area and he's saying he's saying you know these Muslims they're alright because they, before they were under Roman occupation which is far more brutal and interventionist you know, but he's saying the Muslims are alright you pay your taxes they leave you alone you can do whatever you want but I have one criticism of the Muslims right they don't persecute the Jews his criticism of the Muslims of Banu Umayyah was why are they not persecuting the Jews? Right, see how you know the projections change, see how stereotypes form and, and, and roles almost flip. Right? But these people, especially in the, the, the early days, this early few centuries of Islam, they were following guidance from the Prophet. And as a result, they established justice, they, there was relative harmony between different people in different minorities and inshallah one day uh, especially if there's young brothers uh, with zeal and wisdom uh, and and integrity and honesty and patience and perseverance and unity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will liberate these places once again wa sallallahu wa sallam wa ala alihi wa I don't know when salah uh, four minutes, five When's the other Five minutes. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of similarities um, and some differences, but you know. Um, we have to remember that Salah uh, rahimahullah, he, he spent many years first try, writing letters to different um, Muslim kind of uh, kingdoms and, and countries to try and get them to take the matter of Al-Aqsa seriously, you know, and it's a long process. So. And in fact, not just Salah but we've been talking about the previous nations even, from Banu Israel and different, you know, what um, features led to their liberating Aqsa and then losing it right and these these features um, uh, seem to repeat themselves subhanAllah so alhamdulillah okay let's get ready for salah jazakallah khairan subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah